Paul had had a, an amazing, uplifting spiritual experience. He called it like being taken up into the third heaven. Not sure if you've had that. That meant like into the highest heaven, a, a major sort of experience of encounter with the Lord and being taken up into his presence in a, uh, a mighty and powerful way. But then he goes on to say that in view of the extraordinary nature of these revelations I've received, to stop me getting proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me and stop me getting too proud. And he pleaded with the Lord to take it away. And then those beautiful words the Lord says, my grace is enough for you. My power is at its best in weakness. So we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. Maybe some say it was a besetting temptation that the Lord allowed to come against him and he pleaded to be set free of it. Maybe some say it was a recurring disease like malaria, which often happened in that country where he was. Um, it kept coming and, and again and again. Maybe it was the opposition and the persecution that he went through. And that was his thorn in the flesh. Maybe it was the slander that some had made against him, you know, accusations that were untrue, uh, that he often uh, suffered from. Um, maybe it's just the memories of the past. If you saw that um, film, Paul uh, the Apostle, it seemed to suggest that, you know, there were memories that were afflicting him uh, even as he was an old man or older, uh, those memories of where he'd been murdering people and all that sort of thing. So we don't really know. What we do know is that he had this thorn in the flesh. And, and I think it's um, somewhat characteristic of the spiritual journey that the Lord does allow this to happen. Uh, especially if we're getting a bit proud and a bit self-sufficient about the way things are going in our life and we think we're doing pretty well, then the Lord will provide something uh, to humble us uh, and to uh, bring us down as it were. And, and he, he assures uh, Paul that my grace is enough for you. My power is at its best in weakness. And so what Paul is receiving there is a greater sense of his own personal weakness and suffering, which will lead him to be more and totally dependent on God, not on anything of his own achievements, that he will uh, be able to endure uh, because he's clinging to the Lord, not to any of his achievements, not to how many conversions he's made, not to how powerful his preaching was, not to all the miracles that he was performing, but he clings to the Lord and knowing um, that his grace, the grace of God is sufficient to empower him. Uh, and the Lord says to him, you know, my power is at its best in, in weakness. It's interesting, isn't it, that both Peter and Paul, the two pillars of our faith, had this same experience. Peter, of course, being very sure of himself after three years with the Lord. You know, I'll go to die with you, I'll go to prison if I have to with you, Lord. There's nothing that's going to stop me in following you. And the Lord says to him, oh, Peter, you know, uh, before the cock crows, you'll have disowned me three times. And Peter thought that was totally impossible. That couldn't have possibly happen. But it did happen. You know, that little servant girl, you were one of them. I can tell from your accent. And Peter just goes to water and denies the Lord. So he was brought to that moment of his utter weakness. And in fact, that became like his greatest strength not because of him, but because of the mercy of God that he received through the eyes of Jesus gazing upon him with great mercy. 
And so Paul, the same way, like Paul had been a Pharisee, he'd been sort of, uh, you know, so sure of himself because of the law and what he was about in a spiritual way, but then, of course, brought low on the Damascus Road and blinded, for, made totally helpless. So he would experience that sense of helplessness of the truth of his weakness, of his nothingness before God. Uh, and then he can be useful to God. He thought as a Pharisee he was doing great. But he had to encounter the risen Lord. And strangely enough, encountering the risen Lord is not becoming a superhero. Encountering the risen Lord, uh, we experience our utter weakness, our nothingness and how great and mighty he is. Uh, and he wants us to walk that way in our journey, not by our own strength, by what he will do through us when we know our incapacity, when we know our weakness, that we can't do it without him. So that we're not uh, seeking to be self-made spiritual heroes, but um, not trying to do it for our own insight, our own intelligence, our own natural gifts. The Lord is wanting to get us to that place where we're totally dependent upon Him and His power at work through our weakness. And we truly rely upon the grace of God, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Huh? The great teacher of this, of course, is Therese of Lisieux, uh, you know, who showed us that little way, which is, seems easy to take, but is extremely difficult to take because of the, what is rooted deep in the soul, the pride that's there, and the tendency towards self-sufficiency. And so it's very hard for us in the truth of our hearts to be able to see the depth of our own weakness, our own nothingness, our own incapacity, our own powerlessness. Uh, and so we can become totally dependent upon the Lord and trust in the Lord, know our nothingness before him. That's what Jesus said, didn't he, in John's Gospel. Uh, if you abide in me and I in you, uh, you'll bear fruit in plenty, for cut off from me, you can do nothing. So cut off from me, you can do nothing. So that's the reality, but so often we slip back into self-sufficient mode. I would say that's my fundamental temptation, to become self-sufficient to manage my affairs and manage the ministry, manage everything that God's given to do by oneself. Oh yes, we give sort of a, a bit of a nod to the Lord, but not really under his power and under his grace. And if that happens, like he has a tendency to leave us to our own resources. <laughs> Um, until we wake up, until we get this bit of a jolt, this thorn in the flesh, as it were, that whatever it is that the Lord gives, to reduce us to that place where we are in utter need of him and, and cry out to him from the depths of that place. So he does say, my power is at its best in weakness. And of course, Jesus himself has demonstrated this to us on the cross. Now, when he hung on the cross for our sake, that's the worst thing that could have happened to the world, uh, in one sense, because um, the worst thing that humanity ever did was to nail the Son of God to the cross. And that was like the lowest moment in Jesus of weakness, of powerlessness, of ap 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 emptiness, no total dependence on the Father, though. And so he cries out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so he trusts the Father at that worst time, totally dependent on the Father. 
and that became the font of salvation for the whole world. So he's shown us the pattern of how we're meant to walk in a similar way, not sort of in a proud and self-sufficient way, but with that attitude of knowing my own poverty, knowing my own nothingness, and expecting everything from God. So trusting the Lord, trusting his power at work in and through us, uh, confident in his power at work in and through us, expecting that to be the case, being bold about that. So and even when we are reduced to that, as maybe Paul was at times, reduced to the point where you have fallen in some way, or you've failed dismally, uh, or things have gone terribly wrong, not seeing that necessarily as, the, as a total disaster, there's a moment and an opportunity to throw yourself upon the mercy of God and to be totally confident in his mercy. And he upholds us by his mercy because in reality, any virtue that we have already, any grace, anything that we've received like in terms of that, is all grace, it's all God's gift. It's nothing that we've made happen. We've cooperated with God, of course. But without him, we're lost. Without him, it, we can't advance for, further. And so it's just that opening, I guess, to, to really recognize uh, the truth of our situation before God and to walk in that weakness, walk in our own brokenness, walk uh, and be at home with our own imperfections, but not stay there, but, but to turn to the Lord and to draw our strength from him. You know, he says, my power is at its best in weakness. You know, when, Paul says, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. But not strength that's generated from within myself, but by the Lord himself. It's God's power at work. And so this applies, of course, to our own personal lives and also to our community life. You know, we're celebrating that we're a charismatic community. Uh, and we are. And, and the fundamental grace of the baptism in the Spirit is, is, you've heard me say this before, I'm sure, be able to say to the Lord, I can't do it. But Lord, you can. You have the power to do it, to join your yes with that of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who expresses that so beautifully too. You know, when she simply says, how can this happen? Uh, she knows her own weakness, she knows her own nothingness before God, and, and she's told the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You'll be overshadowed with power from on high. That's how it will happen. So there's a degree that I really know my own weakness, my own brokenness, my own sinfulness, that, uh, to the degree that I really at, uh, see that revelation, and to that degree, the power of God can flow through me. And same with our community as a whole. To the degree that we as a community are not proud and self-sufficient, thinking we're better than others, and looking down our noses at the rest of the church, to the degree that we sort of you know, overcome all that sort of thinking and, and recognize our weakness, our nothingness before God, to that degree he can pick us up and use us powerfully in the life of the church today. And bless his name.